Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about John Mockley and ENIAC. ENIAC was, in some ways, the world's first computer, certainly the world's first computer in the way we describe computers today, meaning electronic and programmable and digital and able to do all sorts of general purpose things. It stood for electronic numerical integrator and calculator. And it was pretty much the creation of this guy, John Mockley, who was one of those guys who loved to share ideas. And sometimes that uh, made him one of the great innovators of our time. Of course, sharing ideas can also get in trouble because uh, what some people consider sharing, other people consider stealing. But we'll get to that in a moment. His father, was at the Carnegie Institute for Science in Washington, which was one of those gentlemen's institutions that helped people share ideas around the world. He was particularly interested in weather, his father, and so he would have people around the world who would take measurements of the weather. And John Mockley soon was helping his dad do that and looking for ways to use mechanical and electromechanical and electronic devices to help collate all the data about weathers. And so young John Mockley decided to travel around and collect ideas the way a bumblebee collects pollen and helps spread it around. And so Mockley would travel to places like Bell Labs where he met George Stibbets, up to Dartmouth where there was a computer conference, went to the 1939 World's Fair in New York, one of the great World's Fairs, and saw uh, different devices that were able to do both computations and even such things as visual imaging on machines. And eventually he was at a conference at the University of Pennsylvania talking about the weather when he runs into the guy we talked about last lecture, John Vincent Adonassoff, that guy from Iowa State University who in the basement of the Iowa State Physics Building was making uh, this sort of numerical computer. And so John Mockley and Adonassoff talked to each other at the conference. Adonassoff says, you know, I've been able to do it with vacuum tubes and I can do it at a very small fraction of the price of others. And so I can do fast calculations very cheaply using vacuum tubes. And what did John Mockley say? He said, I want to come visit you. I want to come see you. And so in 1941, John Mockley, who had been traveling all over, gets into the car with his six-year-old son, Jimmy, and drives all the way from Pennsylvania to Iowa State University, where he meets uh, Adonassoff, and they share ideas. Now, uh, sharing the ideas, Adonassoff's wife was a little bit uh, uncomfortable with that because you know, Adonassoff hadn't really patented his machine yet. And so his wife says, hey, don't show him everything. But Adonassoff, being who he was, takes off the cloth, shows him the machine. Uh, Mockley takes a lot of notes. And Mockley's not really that impressed, he says, because he realizes it's not all electronic. There are sort of rotary drums with condensers and mechanical parts. And only the processing part in the bottom right hand, you can see it on the machine, has a bunch of vacuum tubes. So Mockley left there thinking, all right, one more set of ideas. He liked a few of the ideas, including the memory bank that Adonassoff had, but he didn't think it was really stealing all of Adonassoff's ideas. He thought, okay, just like in all these other places, I've collected a few interesting things I'm going to do. And fortunately for him, a couple of things happen at that point. He gets an appointment to be a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And there he meets a guy named Presper Eckert, J. Presper Eckert, uh, son of a millionaire uh, real estate developer, but more importantly, the grand, great grandson of the person who invented the soft, uh, saltwater taffy uh, machine those machines you see you know, at amusement parks or whatever that can make saltwater taffy. In other words, his family had in its uh, sort of culture, 
this notion of let's invent things and then create businesses around them and let's do it uh, as an engineering thing. Let's make it work. It's not just conceptual ideas, but how are we gonna make saltwater taffy? Or in Presper Eckert's case, it turns out, how are we gonna make some machine that crunches numbers? When Presper Eckert was in college, he was always making mechanical and electronic devices uh, to make money. One of them was called the osculometer. And what it was, was to a couple, a man and a woman, would hold metal balls uh, that had a little bit of, each had an electric charge in it, and they'd kiss. And the machine said, how passionate is your kiss? It would light up lights and ring bells and do all sorts of things. And of course, people kind of learned that if you wanted the flow of electricity to work, a wet, sloppy kiss was usually better. And so it was a great amusement thing, watching couples kiss using his oscillometer. Anyway, another thing that happens in 1941, of course, is Pearl Harbor. We enter World War II. And so creating calculating devices and numerical integrators, in other words, machines that'll do integral equations, sort of the calculus of missile trajectories, becomes really important because the US Army and its ordnance system were making all these artillery machines and shipping them over to Europe. But as important as the machine was the firing table that told an operator of the machine how to calculate exactly where to aim a piece of artillery. And that took a whole lot of calculating to figure out. You needed to know the weight of the ordnance shell, the speed of the wind, the temperature, the angle, maybe 10 or 12 variables all went in to creating a firing table that would say, here's where you aim the missile if you want to hit a particular spot. And then to do those missile trajectories with 10 or 12 variables, it took sometimes a month to do a whole table of calculations. There were people sitting in rooms, usually women, scribbling computations on pieces of paper until they could get the firing tables right. But then Mockley, working with his friend Presper Eckert, writes a paper called The Use of High-Speed Vacuum Tube Devices for Calculating Missile Trajectory. And it says you can calculate a trajectory in 100 seconds. In other words, less than two minutes, shows it to the people in the Army at Aberdeen Proving Ground, which was one of the Army bases to do artillery, not too far from the University of Pennsylvania, and they get a big contract from the Army to build a machine that will do the uh, tabulation of the tables for how do you aim uh, m missiles to get the trajectory right. Once again, it was an understanding that World War II was not just gonna be won by weapons, but it was gonna be won by computation power, by computers. And Press Eckert, the guy on the left there, the engineer, the one whose great grandfather did the saltwater taffy machine, he slept every night almost during the week right next to the machine because he was a total control freak. He watched every piece of soldering and wire and tube in the whole machine because he believed that uh, vision without execution was just hallucination, that you had to sweat the details to get it right. One of his great quotes was, life is made up of a whole concentration of trivial matters. And he would say it when somebody would say, well, that's kind of trivial. Why are you worrying about that? He said, man, it's a trivial matters. God is in the detail. What they do when they create this machine is it does something that Ada Lovelace, an idea that she had come up with exactly 100 years earlier, which is you program it so that it can change the type of calculations it does. It can do missile trajectories, but it also can do explosions or it can do weather. It can do a whole lot of things. It had something that she created in those notes to the difference in analytical engine that she wrote for Charles Babbage's machine. It's called conditional branching which meant as you were doing a calculation, if you got to a certain number, say if the number was over 100, you'd branch one way. And then if the number was under 100, you'd do a different set of programming calculations. 
And so you could do branching and it would sort of modify the program as it went along. It was finally finished in November of 1945, right after the war technically ended, although they had been using it some before that. It was able to do 5,000 calculations per second, making it more than 100 times faster than any machine that had been built. It was not the computer that you're looking at on your lap or on your desk right now. It was 100 feet long. It was eight feet high. It took up a room that's the size of about three dorm rooms uh, smushed together. It was huge. It had more than 17,000 vacuum tubes. There uh, on the left hand of that picture, you can see Press Eckert fiddling with the dial. You see John Mockley leaning against the column. You also see a woman named Jean Bartek. We'll talk about her later because what Eckert and Mockley did was get women to do the programming. They thought that was women's work. Uh, but the women end up doing some great program. That'll be a subject of our later lecture. But for now, let's just reflect on what this was. It was a machine that was fully electronic. It was programmable. It could change programs in the middle of a process. It was electronic. No of these electromagnetic click, clack, click, clack switches. Uh, it was all vacuum tubes. And so in many ways, I think you could call it the world's first computer. Thanks, see you next time.